So early in January, I awoke with this psalm on my heart and I felt the Lord saying we need to proclaim it, we need to memorise it because we're going to need it in the days ahead. And that psalm is Psalm 2. So Laurie and I are going to read it in the Passion Translation because it sets it out as a four-part play, if you like. So Act 1, the nations speak. Thank you, Laurie. How dare the nations plan a rebellion? Their foolish plots are futile. Look at how the power breakers of the world rise up to hold their summit as the ruler's scheme and fur together against Yahweh and his anointed king, saying, Let's come together and break away from the Creator. Once and for all, let's cast off these controlling chains of God and his anointed. And then God speaks. And in fact, he laughs at them. The sovereign one mocks their madness. And then with the fierceness of his fiery anger, he settles the issue and terrifies them to death with these words. I myself have poured out my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will reveal the eternal purpose of God, for he has decreed over me. You are my favoured son, and as your father I have crowned you as my king eternal. Today I became your father. Ask me to give you the nations, and I will do it, and they shall become your legacy. Your domain will stretch to the ends of the earth, and you will shepherd them with unlimited authority, crushing their rebellion as an iron rod smashes jars of clay. And then the Spirit of God says, Listen to me, you rebel kings, and all you upstart judges of the earth. Learn your lesson while there's still time. Serve and worship the awe-inspiring God. Recognize his greatness and bow before him, trembling with reverence in his presence. Fall down before him and kiss the sun before his anger is roused against you. Remember that his wrath can be quickly kindled, but many blessings are waiting for all who turn aside to hide themselves in him. So Psalm 2 is a very important scripture for us at the moment, and we're going to go now to a, a powerful word that was released by Jonathan Kahn in the last week. Jonathan Kahn is a Messianic Jew. He is a rabbi or pastor of a congregation in New York. He's also the best-selling author of Harbinger and Harbinger 2, which was just released. And he's referring to that in what he says here, but it's a powerful word for the newly inaugurated president of the United States. And for years, the church has, has agreed to the idea of separation between church and state, which we'll discuss later. Um, but Jonathan's word, apart from the history of the United States, there are parts that are relevant for us in all Western countries that we really need to hear. So this is Jonathan Kahn's recent word. In the first ever presidential inauguration, the nation's first president addressed a jubilant multitude and a nation that was united in shared values and a common hope in America's future. In that first ever presidential address, George Washington gave the newborn nation a prophetic warning. He said this, the propitious smiles of heaven cannot be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right that heaven itself has ordained. In other words, if America followed the ways of God, his eternal rules of order and right, the blessings of God would remain upon it. But if America should ever depart from the ways of God, then his blessings would be removed from the land. And now, January 20th, 2021, Another presidential inauguration takes place and the nation's capital city, named after that first president, has become a military zone. For the first time in American history, a presidential inauguration is devoid of people. Instead of a jubilant crowd, 25,000 American troops stand guard over the National Mall in which flags stand in for the missing people. And barbed wire surrounds the halls of American government. There is no war. There is no overt threat from beyond its borders. Rather, the threat comes from within. 
Division infects the land as does a plague that has kept its citizens masked and locked in their houses as the nation's functioning has been in large part paralyzed. For months, America's cities have seen protests and riots and doors and windows shuttered and buildings set on fire. And the nation's most revered edifice of government, the Capitol building, taken over by an angry mob with the nation's leaders fleeing for safety. And so the prophetic warning that was given on that day of that first inauguration, the smiles of heaven are being removed from the land. And so the question must be asked, have we then disregarded the eternal rules of order and right that heaven has ordained? America, as did ancient Israel at the height of its prosperity, has turned away from God. We've driven him out of our public squares, out of the schools of our children, out of our culture, out of our lives. And as did ancient Israel, in place of his absence, we've let in other gods and served them. We've rejected his ways and embraced the ways of immorality. We've called evil good and good evil. And as did ancient Israel, we've lifted up the most innocent among us, our babies, and shed their blood. Israel sacrificed thousands of its children. We've sacrificed millions, tens of millions, unborn children who are not here this day, this inaugural day, because we took their lives. And their silent screams ascend to heaven, and their blood is on our hands. We pass down rulings from Washington, D.C. that war against the eternal laws of heaven on human life, human nature, gender, marriage. We've indoctrinated our children against the ways of God. We have done as we were warned not to do, and then we wonder why the blessings of heaven are being removed from our land. When judgment came to ancient Israel, it manifested in the form of an enemy attack, a strike on the land, a wake-up call. He came to America on September 11, 2001. Then he came to the very place where George Washington stood and prayed on the day of America's first presidential inauguration. The biblical template of national judgment then ordains a period of years in which the nation is given the chance to return to God or else head to judgment. In the case of ancient Jerusalem, that period, from that first enemy strike to the year when the greater shakings began was 19 years. From the strike on American soil in 2001 to the 19th year brings us to the year 2020, the year when the great shakings began. The danger that this window of time is drawing to an end is now upon us. We stand in a most critical moment. Mr. President, President Biden, you have called for unity and peace. But how can a nation have unity and peace when it wars against the very foundation on which it stands? How can a nation have unity and peace when it has turned against the God who brought it into existence? And it has turned. The nation that once led its school children in prayer and taught them of his word now declares such prayers and teachings to be forbidden and now instructs its children against the ways of God. How can that nation have unity and peace? How can we have unity and peace in America if we have no unity and peace with God? We are a house divided against itself, and a house divided against itself cannot stand. Mr. President, how can you place your left hand on the Bible, the Word of God, and then with your right hand, sign laws into existence that war against his word. How can you place one hand on the word that ordains human life as sacred and in the image of God from conception? And then with the other hand, sign laws into existence that will promulgate the killing of that human life of those children. How can you invoke the name of God in your oath and lay your hand upon his word? And then implement laws that will suppress the going forth of his word, that will censor his word and those who advance it. You plan to enact laws that will disregard the distinction between male and female, man and woman. 
Did not the warning of our first president involve that very thing? If we disregard the eternal rules of order that heaven itself has ordained. You plan to enact laws that will specifically neutralize the protection of religious freedom. You plan to strike down the Hyde Amendment so that more children will be murdered and those Americans who recognize abortion as murder will be forced to support the act of murder with their taxes. And you plan to empower the act of killing unborn children not only within the borders of America, but throughout the world to the end that yet more rivers of blood will flow. How does one do such things and name oneself as a believer in God and a follower of Jesus? How does one sign the sign of the cross and then sign decrees that rage against what God has so clearly set forth in his word concerning life and death, holiness and sin, righteousness and immorality, good and evil? To you, Mr. President, and all who have joined you in this agenda, from the Vice President to the leaders of the Senate and the House, and all who sit in halls of power and have embraced this agenda, heed this warning. This day will pass. The applause of men will fade. This administration will inevitably be over. This world will pass away, but you will stand before God and give account, for it is written in his word that we will each stand before God and give account. And on that day, all the power you once wielded will be gone, and all of the world's approval and praises will have faded away, and all the fame and glory you received will amount to nothing. In the day when the book of history is closed... And the book of life is opened. None of that will matter. It will be you and him. And you will be required to give account of what you have done. Did you follow the will and word of God? Or did you not? If you pursue these things, then you did not. And the blood of children will be on your hands. And then will come eternal life or eternal judgment. The voice of God calls out to you and to all to turn and follow him with all your heart, who gave all his heart and life that you might be saved. As for America, the problem is not social or economic or cultural or political. The problem is ultimately spiritual. And so must be the answer. America has turned away from God. And its only hope is that it return to God. Choose true greatness and lead in that return. Or continue in this departure from God to destruction and judgment. As for those of you who love this nation and are burdened and fearful for its future, America's only hope is revival, return. Without it, the nation is lost. And revival only comes through repentance and return. It's time to pray as never before that return and revival would come. But it's time not only to pray for revival, but to choose revival, to choose to live in revival now. And for that, we must each commit to return to God, to put away from our lives that which must be put away and take up that which must be taken up and walk in his ways and live in his spirit as we have never done before. For the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the entire earth, looking for the one whose heart is completely his, to show himself mighty on their behalf. Let us be that people and revival will come. And if the darkness must come, whether by persecution or disorder or disintegration or apostasy, do not fear. For God is still on the throne, and the darkness cannot overcome the light, but only magnify it. And if the darkness should grow darker, then it's time for the lights of God to shine even brighter. For it is no longer the time of the candle in the day. It is now time for the candle in the night. We are now the candle in the night that shines against the darkness and lights up the night, the world with its radiance. We pray 
that the civilization that was established and consecrated to be a city on a hill, America, would once again shine with a light that once illumined it. But whether or not it does, it is time that each of us shine with the light of his glory. It is time to live unhindered, uncompromised, unbound, bold, and all out on fire and mighty in the power of the living God. For thus says the Lord, arise and shine for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Deep darkness shall cover the earth, but the glory of God shall rise upon you. In the name above every name that is named, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the way, the truth, and the life, the King above all kings, the Lord of all, the hope of the ages, and the answer to every life, the star of Jacob, the prince of life, the glory of Israel, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the name that will remain above all names when all is passed away, Yeshua, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. What a powerful word from Jonathan Kahn. And as I said, we can see so many relevance for our own society, particularly here in Victoria. And it does remind me of the psalm we, we uh, read out at the start, particularly the verse where it says, the power brokers of the world rise up to hold their summit as the rulers scheme and confer together against Yahweh and his anointed king. And we know even, I think it's this week, that there's major conference uh, been happening, world leaders coming together and really planning many things against the word of God. And God laughs at their plans and their schemes. And as Jonathan Kahn reminds us, God is the creator and he is the eternal king. He is the ruler. His government is forever. It often, and, and so I'll just read from Isaiah 9 7, it says, of the increase of of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of david and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this and of course that passage in isaiah is straight after the prophecy about jesus coming um, in the flesh which we read at christmas time of course um, but it's this part about the government. And so there's these debates about what's the place of the church with government. So quickly in the scripture, first of all, we, we've got this scripture about God as the creator. He's the eternal king. He will sit on the throne of David, which was actually established in the tabernacle of David, where God's people and government work together. So you had the praises and prayer in the tent and then the king ruled in his palace next door. So you've got the government and the house of God together. Then in the second temple, you've got which was rebuilt by Ezra, you've got King Cyrus's decree, Zerubbabel the governor, or what we probably call a mayor of Jerusalem, and Joshua the high priest were together building the house of God, which of course Jesus said is a house of prayer and praise for all nations. And in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus spoke about the gates of hell not prevailing against the church. And that word for church in Greek is ekklesia, which means a legislative assembly. Now, in Victoria, our lower house is a legislative assembly. So it's really speaking of the church being a government, a spiritual government. And following on in that passage and also in Matthew 18, Jesus spoke about giving us the keys of the kingdom to forbid what's not allowed in heaven. And you can see that list in Revelation 21 and 22 and through a lot of Paul's writings. So we don't just make up what we can forbid. It's, it's there in the word of God. But he's given us the authority to forbid it, but also to encourage and increase what God allows. So we know in society there's been a big debate for many, many years there should be a separation of church and state. Don't get into politics. So I'm going to ask Laurie now, what's the difference between politics and government? Um, because politics is like a dirty word, but the word of God speaks about government. Well, 
probably the one way of putting it would be to say that politics is about who's going to be the government and what the government should do rather than actually necessarily being the government. Mm. Um, there's always that competitive, in our democracy, there's that competitive um, aspect to getting into government and, and staying there once you get there. Mm. Uh, you know, whereas government itself is more about the um, bringing good order to society, making and security, safety, mm. uh, providing the types of services that only governments can provide, mm. and generally making sure the nation runs properly. Yeah, so law and order, defence forces and so forth, mm. which is very different to the political games um, and the competition, which is not what the Lord is speaking about for the church, but he's speaking about the government, the spiritual government of those things. Yesterday, I heard Tucker Carlson, he's a um, commentator in America on Fox, and he said this telling statement, which fits in with what Jonathan Kahn said. He said, the US government is at war with its own people. And... Um, you know, Jonathan Kahn, in that word we just spoke about, he said the presidential inauguration took place as a military zone with no people, yet it was not at war, but the threat was within its division and paralysed. You spoke the word, the word totalitarianism. Totalitarianism. Yeah. yeah, so can you tell us about that in terms of this? Um well, to define totalitarianism, let's look at some of the examples, and they mainly in communist countries, where the government rules every part of a person's life. Um, like in North Korea, they get the only choose on one of six haircuts. <laughs> and you're not allowed to have the same one as the um, premier, whose mm. name I forget. Um, we're seeing it creeping in now. And I think you've got to move on to this a bit the later next about part, the, yes. uh, the conversion bill where the government's telling people what they can talk about and what they can't talk yeah. about, and even in private as consenting adults. But that also goes to big tech and all that they're saying too, what you can say and what not, what you can't say. Mm -hmm. That sort of idea as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's a big part of it, the censorship. Mm. So it really comes down to that dictatorship and that all that sort of controlling mm. aspect of government, which is not the role of government, because even God himself has given us all free choice. Mm. And, um, of course, we're responsible for what we choose in that, but, but he gives us the, the free choice. And the government's trying to, in some ways, take it away and then mm. not do it in, by erosion, right? Yeah. And not in a biblical sense. So, um, as Jonathan Kahn spoke about, we, we know our history is different to America, but George Washington's word that he spoke about is true for us too. The smiles of heaven that Jonathan Kahn spoke about comes when a nation follows the laws of God. But if we depart his laws, the blessings are removed, not just on individuals, but as a nation. And so here in Australia, have we too disregarded the laws of God? And um, like Israel at the height of prosperity, are we now calling good evil and evil good? And last week we spoke about the shedding of innocent blood and how 40% of, sorry, 45% of all deaths worldwide in 2020 were from abortion. And yet we don't shut down our economy to deal with abortion, but we have with the virus, not saying that it's not serious, but we're just looking at the, the comparison there. And Jonathan Kahn's Harbigen 2, the book that he wrote, which is um, the material he spoke about that we just played, he, he really goes into it very deeply. And it was about God's warning that he gave to America before 9-11 and since. And it's a, a very, very powerful book. But the call for unity and peace um, yet governments are warring against the foundation of unity and peace. That's such a, um, such a profound statement. And we, we need to really look at these things and really meditate upon them, what God is saying to us. 
another pastor in uh, California, an evangelical pastor, his church was shut down and he's, he's refused to be shut down, uh, Pastor John MacArthur. There have been legal battles and he said no. And so these churches are standing together, even in, in the courts. And he said a similar word to Jonathan Kahn. He said, be careful when you put your hand on the word of God. And, you know, our politicians do the same thing when they take oaths, don't they? They put their hand on the word of God. And effectively, what Jonathan Kahn said was then with the right hand, making laws that are against his word. In this last week, the Lord really spoke to me from an old hymn and said, we your anchor hold in the storms of life. And he said to me, you need to get back to basics. And there's two plus two basics, two foundations from the Lord gave us, which is his cross and his word. That we really, these are the basics we cannot escape from. But there's two foundations for us to return to God. And that's we yield to him and we praise him. And from that foundation, everything else builds. So we're going to listen to Karen Davis again, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So yesterday in Victoria, two important things were, if you like, in the media, one on social media and one in the Herald Sun. Bill Muhlenberg, who is a Messianic believer in Melbourne, He's a, an author who writes a lot of Christian um, magazines, and he said this yesterday. In case you have not noticed, the days of comfortable Christianity in the West are now long gone. In a very short period of time, we have moved from being a Christian West to a post-Christian West to an anti-Christian West. And I think that's a very profound statement that the days of comfortable Christianity have gone. That era is over. That's affirmed by what was put in the Herald Sun yesterday, a two-page advertisement from the Australian Christian Lobby. And the heading read, Dear Premier, we are not criminals. And this was a letter signed by 350 faith leaders um, and co-sponsored by the Australian Christian Lob Lobby. Martin Isles, who's the head of the Australian Christian Lobby, said the Change or Suppression Conversion Practices Prohibitation Bill 2020 proposed by the Andrews government in Victoria is the biggest attack on religious freedom in Australia's history. It could put people like you and me in jail. It will certainly see criminal action against Christian parents. It could even outlaw the teaching of the Bible. And so there was a two-page spread of signatures from leaders across church leaders across Victoria, including many in Bendigo. We ourselves signed a letter to the Premier. Um, it included all denominations, Baptist, Anglican, Salvation Army, Presbyterian, AOG, lots of independent churches, Jewish organisations. I'm not going to read the whole letter, but, you can, but I'll, I'll read you um, parts of it. It says, The bill encroaches excessively on religious freedoms and makes all faith communities and people of faith vulnerable to prosecution and heavy penalties. For example, among other things, the bill would regulate the subject matter of prayer, according to Clause 5.3. Make some consensual prayers into criminal acts if they pertain to a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Criminalise voluntary faith-based support groups for people who would want to live out their sexual orientation or gender identity consistent with their faith. Make certain conversations about faith-based sexual ethics illegal, as confirmed in the explanatory memorandum. Make all faith-based teaching or discussion on issues of sexual orientation or gender identity legally fraught. Force parents to affirm and encourage a child's felt gender identity at any given time, regardless of circumstance, and permit, permit gender transition medical therapies. This bill will criminalise many common religious practices and many people of various faiths for doing nothing wrong. According to the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities, Section 14, Freedom of thought, conscience, religious and religion and belief, and section nineteen of cultural rights, 
Everyone has the right to think, feel, believe, share and practice his or her beliefs, values and culture publicly. Under this bill, all people of faith will be stripped of their freedom to practice and share their faith. So that's the, the basis of the letter that, that so many church letters signed um, yesterday. And so really, this the Victorian government is wanting to uh, make illegal the biblical attitude to marriage and sexuality. That's that's basically what it is to make it illegal, and that to even have this conversation, we could be thrown into jail. So this is quite a shift away from being a Christian situation. It really goes to what Jonathan Kahn was saying about having your left hand on the Bible to take an oath and the right hand making laws. And, and as Jonathan Kahn said, Mr. President, and we could say Mr. Premier, how can you place your left hand on the Bible, the word of God, and yet with your right hand sign laws into existence that war against the word of God? How can you invoke the name of God in your oath and lay your hand upon his word and then implement laws that will suppress the going forth of his word that will censor his word and those who advance it. So this is quite a challenge for us as believers at this moment. And if it goes through, um, it really will put pressure upon the church, whether we're going to stand with the word of God or whether we're going to compromise. Laurie, yesterday when we were talking about this, um, you were saying about the, is it the International Charter that this, this comes against? The um, United Nations Charter of uh, Human Rights. It's mm. quite possible that it will violate that and on precedent, the Charter of um, International Treaties take precedent over state laws. Mm. You can pray that's the case. Um, there's all sorts of implications for pastors, for teachers, for parents in this. But it goes beyond just Victoria because, um, and people can go on to the um, Australian Christian Lobby. Martin Isles is a, is a lawyer and he's a brilliant young man and he's really laid the case out and he said it's worse than in Russia, <laughs> um, this law. And he was saying that it will impact not just Victorians. He said, for example, if... Um, a past, just say, for example, a pastor in Queensland or New South Wales gets a call to help somebody in Victoria and the Victorian wants help, the Queenslander or New South Wales person could also be charged by this law. It, so it's not just Victoria that's being impacted. It could be the whole nation that could be impacted. They will probably be challenged in the High Court. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's quite a... Um, a huge thing that is there and it's it's gone through the lower house of Victoria but it's due to go through the upper house on Tuesday or Wednesday this week and so um, you know this is a, a really serious thing but I like what Jonathan Kahn said he said as darkness covers the earth and deep darkness the people but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you and so that's the encouraging word to us that as it gets darker that this is the time for the church to rise and shine and so um, after this next song we'll talk about that a little bit more about what you can do as a believer because sometimes we feel like we're powerless but we're not powerless the Lord has given us um, all that we need and so I'm just going to listen to Paul Wilbur again and he sings Lord take up your holy throne Amen. Lord, take up your holy throne. Amen. That's a really encouraging song for us to remember, to play, to encourage ourselves with. Because as particularly in Victoria, as we um, are faced with this legislation this week, and I know people are praying and and people and we need to pray for everyone that signed that newspaper because they can be really under fire and for Martin Isles and the Australian Christian Lobby. It's a really important thing to do. But we just, as we sum up today, 
what are the things that we can each do as the body of Christ? And I just say, first of all, be sure of the basics. In this season, we really need to be sure of the basics. Go deeper into the cross. Go deeper into the word. Proclaim and memorize scriptures like Psalm 2, Psalm 91. And it's interesting, just this, yes, uh, two days ago, um, in one of the messages I got from intercessors um, overseas, a lady was saying that during the lockdown, she took the challenge and she read aloud the whole Bible during lockdown, the whole Bible, cover to cover. And then someone responded and said, did you know there was a revival in North Korea before the current uh, family um, of taking over? There was a powerful revival, even with Kim Jong-un's family. And one of the things that instigated that was the reading aloud of the word of God. It is so powerful, we underestimate. And Laurie's got a testimony about that I'd like him to quickly share. Our family in Darwin. And even as we drove into the city, we, could, we got hit by the insanity of the place. And the, the local Christians told us um, when the visiting ministries come up here, they start off well, then they just go downhill. Mm. There's the um, spirit of the place. It's very oppressive. It turned out that uh, our host had a small swimming pool in the backyard and the children liked to play there. So I went out to supervise them. I sat under the house in the shade under a fan and read my Bible. And I thought, this is a waste just to read it to myself, I shouldn't read it out loud, so I started reading it out loud and I felt the power of doing that and uh, it seemed to get us through, we didn't seem to have mm -hmm. run into the obstacles that other visiting ministries encountered, we did, we encountered them, but I think we got through them actually, mm -hmm. um, whereas some just didn't seem to. Yeah, and it certainly diminished after you started doing that mm. and you've been doing that ever since. Exactly. Yeah, so every day I can, I can testify, Laurie, reads the word aloud in our home. And so that's a really powerful thing. So I got that from France yesterday and from North Korea, and that's our te Laurie's testimony. So I really encourage people to read aloud the word of God and in this season. Um, then the other thing is for us to yield to the Lord each day, to yield to him, to surrender to him. You know, we it's there's so many pockets of fear and even rebellion and resistance to what God wants us to do in each of us. And it really is a disciplined habit to yield to him, to his ways and to his word each day. And then to give him praise. It's The word says, in everything gives praise. Um, for this is the will of God for you. And, you know, the, the book I put out last year was about that. And the thing is, no matter what legislation passes or doesn't pass, the Lord is king forever and that's what his word says and then as i said before discover in revelation 21 and 22 and the other passage what's allowed in heaven and what's not allowed in heaven and we can be affirming that in prayer to pray the word of the lord is the, the most powerful thing not just pray what we want because that's what we call soulish prayers but pray what the word of god says what the holy spirit quickens us to say and that even as this bill is debated in the parliament this week, be decreeing the word of God and send letters to the paper, send letters to the politicians, ring up your MPs, put pressure on them. It's time for the body of Christ to stand up, to stand up for his word and to really resist all the works of the enemy. And so just want to bless you today. Be blessed that it, it doesn't matter what's coming. The Lord remains on his throne and he is the Lord of hosts. So we'll go out today with Shane and Shane, Lord of hosts.